Welcome. This is the Cisco CCNA ENSA, also known as the Enterprise Networking Security and Automation course. This course focuses on the CCNA version 7 curriculum. This is course 3 of 3. Module 8 VPNs and IPsec concepts. So we're going to be looking at VPN technologies, types of VPNs, and we're going to end it with IPsec. So VPN technologies, they are essentially building a private virtual network through a, another form of a network. And the store really will create an end-to-end -end private network. So let me grab my pen. And so even though this is the internet, this is a public cloud, we can actually mimic a link through a public internet to make it seem like there is no network in between. The data is going to be encrypted so that there shouldn't be any form of uh, confidentiality issues. We can do this uh, site to site, location to location. We could do this with a mobile connectivity, a mobile connector. So we could have a mobile worker connecting from anywhere, connecting to the internet and once they connect to the internet, they can launch their mobile connector and then tunnel in from that application to the corporate network, thus being able to gain access to the internal corporate network resources. How do VPNs uh, benefit the network or benefit the organizations? Well, it saves costs. It allows it to be more secure especially as you have mobile workers accessing those resources, if they have to connect via a VPN, you can guarantee those resources are typically behind some type of firewall in the organization. It makes it a little bit more scalable. And lastly, the VPN technology normally sits on top of a layer three network. So it's compatible with traditionally any type of layer two or layer one technology. So any type of WAN connectivity, it doesn't really matter as long as are you able to get to the internet? If yes, then you should be able to leverage that connect that connectivity to use an SS to use a VPN. Again, mobile users use a remote VPN, oftentimes called a SSL VPN. However, that's not the only type. There is an IPsec layer VPN as well. And IPsec normally is used between point to point. However, it's not the only one. So when I say point to point, site to site, what does that mean? That means the end device, the router, the layer three device has a piece of software in it that actually will be uh, tunneling through the internet to the remote device. They both have static addresses, so static IPs. And they're made to handshake with one another. Once they connect with one another, they will exchange certain information, and then it will build a tunnel through the internet. The internal hosts will have no knowledge that they're going through a different network. This device will look as if it is part of the local area network, the part of the LAN. We have the ability to do a remote access VPN, and that basically it dynamically creates and establishes a secure connection between the end device and our gateway. Here, the end device will actually do the call out to the VPN. However, this end device may have a dynamic address, it can be connecting from anywhere on the internet. So the end device has to do the call out. The VPN gateway will have to receive the connection and then establish the connection. So there's a few different types of VPNs. There's the enterprise managed and there's the service provider managed. Enterprise is normally what we're going to be dealing with. That's going to be things like the IPsec or GRE or other forms of Cisco uh, VPNs. Or we could have, again, our remote access VPNs. That's going to be a client-based IPsec, a connection or a clientless SSL connection. Those are going to be our main mobile types of VPNs. 
and that's managed by the enterprise. However, you can have service provider managed VPNs, and that's going to be a layer two or layer three MPLS or older technology like Frame Relay or ATM. However, realistically, on the Cisco exam, we're looking predominantly at the enterprise level VPN technology. And we're not even really scratching the surface, we're just discussing core concepts, and that's it. When we get to our CCMP level, that's when we'll start talking about configuring them. So types of WANs, sorry, types of VPNs. Again, the VPN is WAN independent. Clientless or client based. A clientless VPN connection this will allow the connection and securing using a web browser. A client base, you'll have to have the software installed on your device and the software will call out through the gateway and then build the tunnel that way. Both of these can use an SSL connection or an IPsec connection. So some SSL connection uh, features. If we're looking and comparing SSL versus IPsec. Normally SSL is limited to web-based applications and basic file sharing. IPsec is all around better. Authentication, both are fairly strong. Encryption type, again, both are pretty uh, elegant. Connectivity complexity. IPsec normally requires you to install a client. SSL, you can do right through a web browser. The nice thing is SSL has way more connective options where IPsec is very limited in its connection options. We've already talked about site-to-site -site VPNs and again, normally this is done with the hardware like the router, the router will build the tunnel. We have a few different types of VPN technologies, things like the generic routing encapsulation, GRE. While this is not really a secure site-to-site -site VPN tunneling protocol, it is one of the tunneling protocols that is discussed. So you can have secure and non-secure VPN technology. A GRE tunnel basically will encapsulate various network uh, layer protocols and it will use multicast and broadcast traffic. GRE does not by default support encryption, and there it does not provide secure VPN tunneling. A GRE packet can encapsulate an IPsec packet and for it securely. The GRE is not doing the encryption. The IPsec packet is doing the encryption. A standard IPsec VPN, a non-GRE, can only create secure tunnels for unicast traffic unicast being one-to-one. -one. Encapsulating GRE into an IPsec will allow multicast routing protocols to update to use the secure connection through a VPN. Overall, GRE is not used for secure communication. However, GRE in junction with IPsec will build a secure VPN. So what are some of the different layers within our GRE. So there's a few terms we need to look at. Passenger protocols. And that is going to be the original packet that is being encapsulated by GRE at layer 3. So it's either IPv4 or IPv6 or any form of layer 3 packet. We have the carrier protocol. And here the GRE will be the carrier protocol and that will encapsulate the original passenger packet. Lastly, we have a transport packet and that will be the protocol that will be actually be used to forward the GRE packets to the destination and that will be either IPv4 or IPv6. Here is the overall concept. We have the internet. We will build a GRE tunnel through the internet. Through that GRE tunnel we will allow an IPsec VPN to build through that tunnel. The information going through the IPsec VPN is what is secured. The GRE tunnel is not secure. The IPsec portion of it is what is secure. 
We also have what's called the Dynamic Multipoint VPNs or DM VPNs. And this is part of the Cisco software solution for building multiple VPNs in a more easy, more dynamic, and more scalable manner. It does use a hub and spoke technology. It also uses what's known as the Multipoint GRE or MGRE. The MGRE tunnel allows for a single GRE interface to dynamically support multiple IPsec tunnels. Again, the MGRE, it does still handle IPsec, but it will handle multiple IPsec tunnels. The spoke sites can also obtain information about each other, alternatively building direct tunnels between themselves, so we can have a spoke-to-spoke -spoke tunnel, not always a hub-and-spoke tunnel. Realistically, at that point, we're building a mesh-type network. The IPsec portion will build what's called a IPsec Virtual Tunnel Interface, or IPsec VTI. VTI or for short. Basically, the traffic will be sent from the end node to our branch router. The branch router will send it via the VTI through the VTI interface. The VTI interface is the IPsec tunnel, and it will be used to encrypt the data and forward it as a new logical interface. Because between our source and destination routers, the IPsec tunnel will build an encrypted tunnel. And how do we gain access to that tunnel? We gain access by using the virtual tunnel interfaces on both sides. That allows us to pass traffic to and from. The IPsec VTI can be configured between sites or between a hub and spoke based topology. We already kind of started talking about our service provider VPNs using things like MPLS. Well, what's interesting here is we can have a layer two MPL less VPN, and that will be called a virtual private LAN service, or VPLS. And this will be used to emulate an Ethernet multi-access LAN segment over MPLS. There, we're using our switching technology, so no routing would be involved. Again, at this point, we're essentially extending the LAN between two locations. So they'll all be part of the same multicast access network. Moving on, we have our IPsec. IPsec consists of a few different layers. There's two main phases, phase one and phase two. And so we're gonna have to look at the different forms of our, those phases. There's protocols with things like AH, ESP, SA, and Ike. And again, we're gonna explain all of those coming up. So IPsec is a IETF standard defining how VPN will secure data traffic across the network. There are four main functionalities that IPsec VPNs are made to uh, have to handle. Confidentiality, that's gonna be our encryption. Integrity, that's using hashing algorithms to ensure packets are not molested. We have our original, our original authentication and that will be using our Ike protocol or our internet key exchange protocol to authenticate source and destination. We also have the ability to use Diffie-Hellman for our key exchange. Our Diffie-Hellman are also known as DH keys. So again, our IPsec framework will look at the IPsec protocols, AH, ESP, or ESP plus AH. Our confidentiality will be our encryption. We have our integrity, that's gonna be our hashing functions. We have our authentication methods, our pre-shared key versus a RSA-based key. And then we have our Diffie-Hellman type keys for our key exchange. So IPsec is not bound any specific rule for our communication, it is very flexible. So in that regard, let's look at our first section. I like how this is all kind of slanted. AH is basically our authentication header or, that's AH, this is our encapsulation security protocol, ESP. So we can choose what to, enca uh, to encrypt or what to encapsulate. Are we encapsulating the header or the entire packet? Or we can do both. So we can choose AH or ESP to establish the other locations. This is the building blocks of the rest of our packet. 
If we are looking at AH, it's appropriate only when confidentiality is not required or permitted. If confidentiality is required, we need to use ESP. That provides both confidentiality and authentication. Once we've set which IPsec protocol we are going to use, then we have to talk about confidentiality. Again, that's going to be the level of encryption that will be used. And again, the degree of confidentiality will depend on the encryption algorithm and the length of key. What keys do we want to use? Triple DES, DES, weak keys should not be used. So we should be using things like AES or SIL. AES has 128-bit, 192-bit, 256-bit, and more. Our SIL has around 160-bit base keys. After we've decided what confidentiality protocol to use, we need to look at our integrity protocol. Normally, we're going to be looking at some form of hashed message authentication code, HMAC. This will verify data integrity. The two main algorithms are going to be either MD5 or SHA. MD5 is the least secure of the two. SHA is the more secure. And right now, the SHA default key is going to be 160-bit in length. Once we've decided the integrity key, we can look at the authentication. And again, the two main types are pre-shared key or our RSA-based key. If we're using pre-shared key, it's easy to configure, but it doesn't scale very well. And we have to configure this per peer. If we're doing RSA, we can authenticate using digital certificates to identify our peers. However, each peer must authenticate to its opposite peer before the tunnel is basically considered secure. So there is more configuration with the RSA. Lastly, we have our uh, Diffie-Hellman type keys. We have different DH standards, one being the least secure, and our higher ones like DH21, 24, are more secure. Realistically, DH14 is pretty well, uh, is one of the more common ones. DH1, 2, and 5 are not really used anymore. DH groups 5, sorry, 14, 15, 16, they use larger keys uh, for example, DH14 has a key size of 2048 bits. However, larger DH groups like 19, 20, 21 have key sizes of 256 bit, 384 bit, and so forth. However, DH groups of 19, 20, 21 will use the elliptical curve cryptography based system or ECC. This helps reduce the time needed to generate keys where DH groups 14, 15, 16 do not use ECC, they use other forms of key exchange. And that is all I had for this chapter. We talked about the basics of what a VPN is, general terminology, site to site versus mobile. We looked at certain VPN technologies like IPsec, GRE, non-GRE, DMVPNs, we looked at how IPsec allows for our tunneling connectivity. We looked at IPsec a little bit more in depth, breaking down the different layers of like AE, AH versus ESP versus AH and ESP, looking at the confidentiality, the integrity, the authentication, and the DH groups. And that is all I had for this chapter. If you have any questions, concerns, please reach out. Thank you. If you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out. Again, with this material, being able to ask questions and discuss some of the topics in the lecture help build long-term retention, so do not be afraid to, to communicate with this topic. Again, I'm here if you need anything. Thank you.